Welcome to tonight's podcast with Ryan Sean O'Reilly, David Wilkinson, and Richard Mell. This is There Is No Deodorant in Outer Space. Now, let's begin. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. And welcome back to another episode of No Deodorant in Outer Space. My name is Ryan Sean O'Reilly, and with me, as usual, is David Wilkinson. Hello, good evening. And the esteemed Richard Mel. Hey, everybody. Now, uh, in this podcast, Rick is actually, Rick normally records with me at my uh, residence. Uh, however, today's podcast, he is actually in the state of Indiana. I am state away. So. I am. Uh, I am in the uh, in the town of uh, Culver, Indiana, which is Marshall County. It's about uh, it's about smack dab in the middle of the state, uh, but north. Uh, so it's right on this lake called Lake Maxincucky, and about seven doors down from the old high school I used to go to called Culver Academies. Um, this house was uh, at one point owned by. The Vonnegut family, which would include Kurt Vonnegut, obviously, and this was one of the homes that uh, Kurt would hang out in during the summertime uh, when his family would take vacation from Indianapolis. So we're trying to uh, restore this old house and stock it with a lot of uh, antique-type furniture and books that are regional and sort of related to uh all of Kirk Vonnegut's works. Uh, so it's coming along. Are you guys intending to make it to like a museum or something? Or Well, uh, the objective is to make it into a, uh, a rental property for a lot of the people involved with the academies. People want to come up and, you know, do graduation visit for reunions, visit for um, hockey games or other events kind of like that. Okay. Um, the, the fan just went on in here. There's a little bit of work still uh, going on in here, so I don't know if that's something you can fix there, Ryan. So that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And just to point out, I am in my my basement in the room that my daughter's called the pooping bathroom. It's uh, where I have my office and bathroom. So not as exciting, but worth noting. Now, <laughs> now, Dave, is Stink Headquarters is that your normal podcast uh, uh, place? This is my normal place for all things. It's where I shower at least once a month, whether I need to or not. There, at least you get hosed down. It's where I work out also once a month. <laughs> once a month. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, we, well, we got a new house, and there's a, there was a little bonus bedroom in the basement, which I turned into an office, and uh, has a finish, has a bathroom in here with a shower, so I kind of, it's my own little area, right? I do various, various things. I, I live with four women, all of, you know, so it's a... Uh, not like in a fun freeze company kind of way, but in my wife and three daughters kind of way. Somewhat so, of a uh, my, masculine yeah. sanctuary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I'm the maintenance man in the sorority, and this is where I curl down to in a little ball. So, <laughs> okay. But yeah, enough about me. Excellent. Let's, let's get on with this. Okay, so tonight we're going to be reviewing The Savage Tales of Solomon Kane, written by Robert E. Howard, and the movie Solomon Kane, directed by Michael Bassett. So let's go around real quick, and everyone just give a one sentence, you know, summary of your thoughts to set up tonight's uh, tonight's show. Rick, let's start with you. Oh, great. Uh, well, uh, Solomon Kane uh, strikes me as a sort of uh, take no prisoners type of hero, all in the uh, name of God and his Puritan faith. Okay, Wilk. If Joan of Arc and Elliot Ness had a baby, it would be Solomon Kane. Oh, very interesting. There you go. And I only have this to say, a question. Why was I not taught about Solomon Cain when I learned about pilgrims in grade school? Oh. That's liberal education. Yeah, okay. <laughs> nice little package. All right. The author of Solomon Cain is actually the author of Conan the Barbarian, so he, who's famous for his various characters that have lived on. Rick, you're going to tell us a little bit about Mr. Howard. Yeah. Um, Robert E. Howard. Born in uh, 1906 in uh, Piaster, Texas. Grew up in uh, Cross Plains, which is kind of an interesting town, uh, given the fact that uh, kind of series of events that had happened over there and had helped shape his worldview while he was growing up there with his mom and uh, sometimes probably with his father, who was somewhat of a jackass and wise ass. 
always was out there to make a quick buck, his father was. He tried to specialize in medicine. His father was actually a physician, right? Yeah, yeah. He was a physician, and you know, I don't know exactly what school he went to for his, his medical education, but it uh, sounded like he was always for the kind of quick buck. Yeah. I don't think he was a physician to actually help people. He was a physician to sort of make it rich quick. Yeah, it was. I, I, I read that too. That was kind of interesting because I thought if he's a physician – why was he so interested in getting rich quick? But if he was in these small towns as like maybe a general practice physician, if that's what the case was, maybe it was difficult right. to find work. And, you know, and that's why they... Well, no, in his case, it, it wasn't too difficult at all in Cross Plains. And I'm not sure exactly when they moved into Cross Plains, but Cross Plains was a small town, quite quaint. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, someone struck oil there and it became a real bustling town, probably grow like tenfold. All of a sudden, the crime rate went up. The, the government bureaucracy uh, expanded and there were a lot more problems in that town than were there originally. And all of a sudden, everything Every uh, indigenous uh, resident of Cross Plains had more complicated lives and had to deal with more business coming through, which they weren't quite ready for. And everyone who came into Cross Plains was just there temporarily and there to sort of make it rich. They literally sucked the town dry. Sure. And, and you know, I mean... Uh, literally? Or? Well, yeah, they, they, well, the vice crime went up. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> a lot of sucking going on. A lot of sucking going on. Out of the ground, you know, out of... Uh, Probably some prostitutes. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, that, that's what happens, you know. And Howard hated all this. Yeah, it, it's a stress. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. He hated it. Uh, and he especially didn't like the, the, the temporary people that came in. And he didn't like how the government grew when it all happened. So he became a staunch critic of government and of civilization. And that's something that he discussed a lot with his longtime friend, H.B. Lovecraft. Uh, a famous writer in his own right. Yeah, a famous writer. But they, they wrote together in the uh, the pulp magazine, Weird Tales. And they started correspondence when uh, Robert wrote a letter to the editor just expressing his appreciation for some of H.B. Lovecraft's uh, knowledge of uh, Irish history. Which Oh, you know what? Let me expand on that. I, I guess Go ahead. Howard noticed some Gaelic word that H.P. Lovecraft used in some weird way. And Howard at some point got into Celtic history. And so he wrote to the editor about this specific use. And I guess the editor passed the letter along to H.P. Lovecraft, who was impressed that anyone caught what he was trying to do. And then that started this pen pal relationship, essentially. And Howard became part of the, I guess, the Lovecraftian group, which is H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, I guess, corresponded and kept in touch with a lot of authors and encouraged the authors to share their worlds with each other and kind of help each other in the writing craft. I don't know that they ever met in person. I don't know either. Do you think he used the word craft? Yeah, I mean, craft is one way to put it. I mean, it's part of his last name. Do you think he's like, I mean, probably one of the... <laughs> I think you use the word craft a lot, Ryan, when you describe writing. It's just... It's terrible. <laughs> Your writing's good, but like, ah, I, 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 I cringe every time you use the word craft. I'm not that crafty. Uh, are you uh, one of those writers, uh, Ryan, that use like the same word maybe like five times in the same paragraph? <laughs> yeah, I try to avoid things like that. A couple times in each sentence. Word echo. <laughs> anyway, in Cross Plains, he developed a uh, hatred for, for civilization and uh, a love for individualistic barbarism. That kind of uh, came to fruition with a lot of his characters, yes. And he was at – I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. I'll try to stop. But he was at odds with H.P. Lovecraft in that, and that H.P. Lovecraft thought that civilization was the uh, epitome of society and was necessary. And Howard was about – Barbarous. Yeah. He didn't like civilization. Okay, guys, real quick, I'm going to just jump in here. He, he died when he was very young. We'll get into that, I'm sure. But, like, yeah. his ideas probably weren't that well developed. It wasn't like he lived a long life and observed a lot of things there. I mean, like, let's, his right. philosophy was probably evolving, and he's kind of a crazy person, too. So, yeah, I'm, I'm why, why get, get talked that. down and yeah. what he thought and believed? I'm, I'm getting to that. Well, he was very he was very prolific in a short period of time. I agree, I, I, and very talented. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna let you get through the, the bio here. So, okay. yeah. So, uh, one of the biggest forces in his life was his mother. Mother. Uh, his mother was a very literate person, and she really believed in a strong education in writing and 
just sort of with his development, with communication in general. She pushed him very hard where his dad was hardly around and her, his mother sort of didn't like his father after a while and she sort of thought that he was below her eventually. And I don't know if they actually separated or not, but there was a bit of conflict there and it kind of affected uh, Robert Howard. And she was, I guess, I would think that she was, she was so overbearing and such a, a strong influences in his life and it kind of turned him into a mama's boy and uh, that has nothing but uh well as far as i'm concerned it does have some profound negative effects when you are in that situation when you are dependent on your mother for your own sanity which kind of turns rotten and goes to insanity after a while yeah and his mother so, and the mother i'm sure you're going to point out she spent a good deal of her life caring for sickly family members and in the process contracted tuberculosis. Yes, yes. And that was that was hard on her, but it was especially hard on, on Robert, um, young Robert. So uh, she drilled him with poetry, and he was quite gifted uh, with memorizing uh, a lot of the things that he read, especially the poems that he read, and he turned into quite the poet himself. And he enjoyed poetry more than he enjoyed a lot of the other things that he wrote, except he was pretty industrious and he wanted to make a living out of writing. So he had to kind of pull out the kitchen sink and he actually learned how to uh, change his writing to be more marketable to the uh, the stuff that he loved to read and the stuff that he read in his pastimes, which were sort of like weird tales. And, you know, that was the magazine that he eventually wrote for. He submitted a lot and he was rejected a lot. So he had to put up with that quite a bit before he actually was published eventually you know his his adjusting to his own writing made him more marketable to publications such as that and eventually he got on a roll and he he made a decent living while he was alive doing that he relied a lot upon his his knowledge of history and a lot of his characters wasn't he didn't he study uh history in school wasn't he a history student well yeah he studied history he didn't he of course he studied history everyone studies history but he, he took it very seriously yeah, but what did he major in it or something? no i don't know if he majored in it yeah uh, he took it very seriously yeah, uh, that's what I got of it. Yeah, but he did. But he hated school. I think in general, he hated school, and he also hated yeah. uh, being under the authority of others. Yeah, he hated authority. Very individualistic, which is very. It's obvious uh, when you read about his his heroes. You know, they are beholden to no one. They are true individuals, and they do what they want. Uh, yeah. you, you basically ask his heroes what they think, uh, and you don't try and change what they think. You basically get their opinion and that's it and a lot of it is pretty hard-boiled due to the fact that yeah he lived down in texas and you know a lot of the the gossip and stuff like that around cross plains was about you know just kind of seedy shit like you know lynchings and you know murder and just kind of hard-boiled stuff and he translated a lot of that to his writing and and when he was you know with his father while he was Working as a doctor, he would see a lot of this carnage and stuff, and a lot of it came out in his writing. And he wrote about it pretty graphically, uh, which is kind of a, a novel thing. I, I don't know. Like, there's not a lot of things that are a, a lot of pieces of uh, literature that are that go into graphic violence, especially then. I would think. Uh, so I would think it'd be pretty novel, and he would basically. Well, I wonder if it it fit in with the pulp magazine genre that he was writing for yeah, i don't know much about the pulp magazine genre yeah um i think i, I uh, think it would be more it's less literary but it would probably but i have read hp lovecraft and I've, I've read a ton of his stories and they're not nearly as graphic yeah. and hp lovecraft did get published quite a bit yeah um, and they're both uh, they, they were just a, a little bit more weird than violent yeah. you know yeah and, and same thing with edgar Allan poe i mean he was he was more weird and sinister than he was like just absolute violent and sort of swashbuckling action, you know. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like how he gained his fame was he uh, he was an action writer. Yeah, he also wrote stories about boxers, I yeah, co cowboys and sailors and stuff. Yeah, very masculine topics and you know yeah. the uh, the plight of the individual uh, against uh, all odds, you know. Okay. So. Um, Anyway, I'm going to get to the uh, the insane part of his life, uh, which is when his mother went into a coma. And, uh, you know, as soon as he found out that she, her, her coma was going to last for longer than, you know, indefinite time, he went out uh, to the parking lot, went to his glove compartment, 
pulled the gun out and shot himself in the head when he was gone. And he was only 30, 31 years old. No, yeah, he was 30 years old. There's a lot of speculation about... 31, sorry. ...whether or not he had mental illness or this was just stress. They, I was actually reading that there's a lot of evidence to show that he, this was uh, something he had talked about previously with people. He sort of made arrangements to plan this out. He, he had he borrowed him from someone. Uh, they think that maybe his mm-hmm. father had probably hidden his own guns away. He had made mention of of it. Uh, I think in the past to his father, and uh, and I think on his typewriter didn't he leave a four line couplet before he died? Yeah, he's on, on his um, typewriter. They found a blank couplet that said. All fled, all done, so lift me on the pyre. The feast is over, and the lamps expire. So, mm-hmm. it's a very tragic loss. Um, and he always knew that he wouldn't live he didn't want to. Uh, a very yeah. long time. He did He did want to die young. Yeah, he, yeah. He, and his characters are all strong, sort of youthful characters, mm-hmm. for the most part. Right. And, uh, boy, he had a lot of pressures going on. I think with his mother being so close and probably keeping him closer because of her illness. There's a whole thing with him. He had probably one serious girlfriend in his life. Her name was uh, Naveline Price. And they dated very passionately and very seriously for a couple years. And she would, and when she first met him, she, or she tried to call his house. And it, the mother kept not passing on the messages to, to, to Robert. Like she was jealous, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So finally, the girl not, uh, had to go to the house in person, mm-hmm. and then he was, and then they they started dating. But she soon became frustrated because of how much time he would devote to his mother, and they just could never get it together and move the the, the relationship forward to marriage, though they both uh, contemplated. It, and she eventually moved away. Yeah. So it, he was. It's a very real thing. I mean, I I have some family members who have that same problem, and, and there have been divorces in my family because of. Uh, the close relationship that some of my family had with their own mothers and with their own fathers. I mean, it was, it was just priorities were different, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, so he's dealing with his mother's illness getting worse. He's dealing with the loss of this serious relationship. And actually that, that girlfriend years later went on to write sort of a biography about Robert Howard from her, you know, period of knowing him. And they actually made that into a movie. It was called The Whole Wide World, and it starred uh, Vincent Tianafreo and Renee Zelliger. And she excellently, from that film, went on to do Jerry Maguire and got uh, noticed from that film. Or they, she was able to use that film to show that she could do the, her range. Um, and I, I actually watched that film, and it was, it was kind of it was interesting because it's... Oh, yeah, Jerry Maguire was not interesting. Jerry Maguire. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, at least something's interesting. God, I, I'm zoning out here. You I often do, I notice, when we talk about. about the biographies. But in any sense, I think Howard is a very interesting character uh, in, in, in himself. And, man, he's the artist that we, we, we love to love. He's the self-made martyr. Oh, God, can we just move on? Let's move on. You, 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 with someone like him, you're always thinking... Yes, yeah, yeah. He, personally, personally, I don't think his life is that he interesting. He wrote some fucking books that we're, we're going to talk about at some point, right? <laughs> right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He killed himself when he was 30. Yeah. It's not that remarkable. Uninteresting. He's a good writer right. from Texas. I didn't want to embellish, but... Well, I, I think did. it's it's, Sorry, it's, it's one of stories oh, that you can really Jesus Christ, feel, just... and you, you feel, oh, what could have been? You know, if this guy would have lived. He, during his life, he actually never published a full book. He only published in the magazines. Yeah. Solely short stories. I, I, I say if someone decides to take their fucking life, it's not even worth fucking talking about. I, I, I swear to God, I am going to kill myself if you keep talking about this. <laughs> so there's a lot of what-ifs with someone like that, and, and, and this probably contributes to the success. It sucks. It's fucking tragic. Who gives a shit? You know, once someone fucking does that... You just fucking oh, ignore it. What could have been an interesting podcast is just delving into a discussion. Okay, you, all right, you heartless bastards. God. All right, all right, you heartless bastards. Fine, move on. Wilk, why don't you give us a synopsis of the book? And keeping in mind, uh, it's actually not a book. It's a collection of short stories. I'll, 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 I'll keep that in mind. It's a collection of short stories, not a book. And it's about Solomon Cain. There's some poems in there, some short stories. And I it, like the poems better. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's kind of a... I mean, I, I enjoyed reading it because there's lots of pictures and it's short. Um, I also got an audio book at one point because I did a lot of driving in a week and I listened to it in my car, which is kind of a different format. But it's, I don't know, it's kind of the second, no, it's the third book that we've read here where it's definitely oldie style. You know, it's pulp, 
Paul Bearer. Yeah. And uh, it's got some lovely, uh, I mean, I, I think in his spare time, Howard taught diversity classes at the local university, how to, you know, un- entertain and understand other cultures in a tolerant way, because, man, I, he, he, he has some lines in there that I, I would just read aloud to my wife, and she's like, I can't believe you're reading this. I'm like, I, I know, this is amazing. Yeah, he, 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 he had yeah. a fascination with Africa, and um, I, I did zone out. I don't know if Howard's ever been to Africa. No. I was there I think he's been. for a while. I enjoyed it, and I, I love reading books about Africa. And uh, I mean, I, I think most studies of about Africa were, were based upon other books he had read in, in the in the weird magazine. But that, that being said, I, I I like the style of the main character. I mean, like he he didn't really know. He kind of alluded at points that he may have been misguided. I got the impression that maybe Solomon Kane was a little bit uh, insane. That's where I get the Joan of Arc thing. But he's kind of like Elliot Ness too. Like I mean, there's there's some lines here and there, and of course I don't. I don't... Yeah, well, you know he. he... He describes himself. Solomon Kane describes himself as a fanatic, right? And there's at least two occasions where the people he's chased are like, "Dude, why are you here? <laughs> what what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, you've really gone to a lot of effort to get me." And like, they're like he's like, "I have. Why? I don't know." And uh, <laughs> but I, I, the style. I mean, what I've learned though, I really do like these pulp stories. Even <laughs> to me, it's almost it's it's a true insight into a different time. I mean, I like I like listening to old radio shows and watching old movies to tell people spoke. Just and I, and I'm married to a speech pathologist who has a lot of comments too about that kind of stuff. But yeah, it, it's really interesting to, to look at the snapshot of Americana from almost 100 years ago and uh, see what a bunch of racist assholes we all were. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The, unfortunately, it's got the historical kind of racist stuff. Although it's not completely um, irredeemable. The, Sol- the Solomon Kane character, you know, it, some people might say he's sort of a one-dimensional character, but I really feel like he's not, and he does kind of grow throughout the the, the, the stories. It actually starts, I think, in England, right? And it's sort of like swashbuckling tales, and then progresses. Eventually, this character ends up doing stories in in Africa, and. Um, getting involved with these African tribes and stuff. And then it gets into like weird stuff with like voodoo and black magic and demons and stuff, which is, I, I thought was all fascinating. Real, real quick, Ryan, I, I, with, with great trepidation, I ask you this question. So I don't <laughs> have you go off on a tangent, but I didn't check the book. Were the stories written in chronological order from when they were published in the book that we all have, the Savage Hills, Solomon Kane, or were they put in that order just, just cause? You know, um, I don't know. I have a theory. Okay. I have a theory that it was chronological. Uh, just because they got a little bit more uh, uh, developed and uh, rich as it went on. They started out as one-dimensional, and they ended up uh, being a little bit more uh, enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know if they're put in chronologically, but I did. there is a website where they actually have – I'll put a link on the on the on our, our website uh, – where they have the chronology timeline of Solomon Cain's life. And so – if you look at that, you could figure out if the sort how you know what order the stories oh, cool. were written. But I, I I didn't figure that out. Yeah, and again, I I did like the stories. They created this tension. I like the style. I think he's a very good writer. I kind of read, read the the Conan stuff now. Yeah, if I have time. But yeah, it, I I guess overall, I mean, I, I like the the action adventure storytelling and. Uh, I, I, people said that he created a certain style of stories, like a sword and sword and sorcery, cloak or sword, sword and sorcery, yeah. no. which I have never heard that term before until I read that he created it. But yeah. I guess I mean it's I, a popular term. I, and again, mm-hmm. I hate to hate to say this again to you, Ryan, but where do you think J.R. Tolkien fits into that that craft? Via J.R. Tolkien is different. J.R. Tolkien is epic fantasy. You know, if you notice the difference between this and Tol- Tolkien is, you know, huge whole worlds, kingdoms moving about. I think Howard is a lot more focused on the individual and, and like in sword fighting and stuff. Hey, well, and kind of like John Carter. Yeah, John I mean, Carter. Very similar yeah. protagonist, yep. well, style, I guess. Yeah. Only, I mean, Solomon Kane didn't really mind Indians that much. So, I mean, yeah, God, uh, that'd be a great crossover. Well, okay, you know, but, I'll say yeah. this. As far as the racial stuff, I mean, at some point you have Solomon Kane getting his magical staff from an African shaman, and he later mm-hmm. describes that character as his blood brother. And he's also saving oh, yeah. African tribes. So, But he still questions that relationship yeah. uh, with great suspicion because he's black. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he doesn't – it's not that he's a racist character. It's just the right itself is just so innately racist without even God, yeah. thinking about it. Like It's like there's this lines there about like, well – these these dark people in their dark ways could never aspire to that of a white man. I'm like, yeah, well, that's that's that probably shouldn't have been left in there. Some some <laughs> people know. counter that by saying that Howard used 
racial or cultural descriptions to shortcut getting information into his stories. You know, yeah, you can take it how you want, but it's a different time. That that it's a, too. It's a different time, and I, I mean, again, people like we all have older relatives who've probably said things that we would want them to repeat. Um, and you know, this guy he died in what 1930, 1936. Yeah. So mm-hmm. God knows what he was exposed to, what he thought about Africa. And I mean, like, I mean, and, and really, Africa. I mean, probably the reputation had from someone at that point was it is a savage land. Mm-hmm. That's you know, and and I don't know. I, it wasn't like racist, racist. It was just, just incredibly insensitive in the context of reality. Yeah, well, with the stories that he wrote, it's a great environment for uh, the adventure and kind of the unknown. Yeah, you know, I, what I thought was interesting is even though Solomon Cain is supposedly doing God's work, there there's a lack of like. I mean, there are some mentions about biblical things, but it's very minimal. So I think a modern writer would come into this quoting the Bible and doing all these things with Scripture, oh, sure. and there's n- there's but, none of that in here, it, which is. But let's but let's say Howard hadn't died. I got the impression that at some point the big reveal be is that he's not doing God's work. He is just a crazy motherfucker <laughs> obsessed with Satan. He remind I, I, he reminds me of schizophrenics. I mean, I, I I worked in a group home for schizophrenic men, and they were all obsessed with Hitler and evil and Satan. And Solomon Cain, you know, he's like just bent on doing these things. I'm like, ah, jeez. <laughs> I mean, like, God's not really telling you to do this. You're not getting any positive reinforcement either. I mean, like, and he's so quick to say, it's a Satan. Satan's here. This is, I mean, everything is Satan's doing or fault. It, it, it never turns out to be Satan, really. But it's just kind of a, I don't know. My, my take is that maybe he's just a, a nut job. I think it's historically accurate. I mean, there was there was a lot of God fearing during the times of Solomon Cain. Uh, you know, back in the sixth or seventeenth century, I believe that's kind of a little bit before the Renaissance. And you know, if if you weren't like a pagan, I mean, you you were really kind of either a savage, a raping and pillaging, or you, you just feared God and you were just trying to keep as low a profile as possible. It was really well, but he's not keeping a low profile. No, not at all. Huh. He was just kind of the Ultimate exception. He's sticking swords in people's eyes. Fuck yeah, he was. The rapier. Which was a, which was a great scene in one of those stories. Uh, you know, uh, he's also very consistent. I mean, he, he doesn't have any love interests. He doesn't, you know, uh, get carried away with women. He, he's, he's just like, he, he, he's just interesting because he's just, he's always on the move and just like wherever God leads me and I find evil, I'm going to root it out. And he's like a, a bulldog where he, when he finds something evil, he's going to keep, Getting at it, getting at it, getting at it until he yeah. dies well, trying. It's an archetype for a lot of classic characters. I mean, look at the 60s with yeah. the Dragnet. Um, uh, and again, uh, Elliot Ness comes to mind when he's portrayed just this law and order, no, you know, nothing but the facts kind of thing. Uh, uh, did, you, did you guys ever read Constantine the comic or not the film with Keanu Reeves? Okay, then I'm not going to. No. It's kind of a more contemporary version of Solomon Kane, but that's okay. a. Okay, I'm good at that. What about his weapons? It's such a mi- interesting mix match. He's got Raper. like a sword, a, 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 dir- a dirk, or a, you know, uh, knives, and then he's got pistols and sometimes a musket, and then he's got this black magic mm-hmm. staff. Sort of the uh, staff of Solomon. It's a good staff to have. Yeah, it, it, it's it's like when you, if someone were to just tell you about this character, you you you'd think it was a joke. This this like pilgrim guy running around with. You know, shooting demons in the face with a well, musket. Well, dude, as a general rule, if I hear anybody has a staff as a weapon, I immediately want to meet them. That's like just a life, <laughs> life, life lesson, life loss. Like, oh, this guy, he's uh, he's got a staff. And he's doing. Oh, I'm there. I'm gonna go check it out yeah. because ultimately, how much damage can you do with the staff? That person's gonna be a lot of fun. Hopefully, they have a bathrobe too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Pink quartz fixated at the top of the staff. Be a nice touch. Oh, uh, I I'd say the one thing about. Howard's writing is there's a lot of heart and when he hits his stride I think Stephen King described it as electric I mean you really feel it and it really pulls you in and he he separated himself out from a lot of his contemporaries obviously because here we are how many hour, uh, years later talking about this and hours later yeah and, and it caught my imagination I thought I mean I didn't think the writing was very good I'm sorry to mention the racism thing I just uh that was more of an aside to the the time again too so but yeah the, the storytelling was fantastic better than john carter yeah i i thought it went into almost too much detail and it was vivid you know it, it didn't leave much for the imagination which during my adult life i i appreciate more and more i i do like poetry i like the abstractness of writing and when it can get to that point and uh, provoke some thoughts this however it reads so graphically it, it really paints the picture which is is good for uh, maybe a younger generation. I, I would probably like it a lot better if I was 16 years old. I would have been really into it. 
Oh, I think this is before TV. This is before home theaters. Yep. I mean, this is these were magazines that were probably geared even really before the golden era of comic books. I mean, this was like, uh, you know, the, the detail was there, so people they couldn't watch TV. They couldn't get their mm-hmm. their violence porn. Right. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I mean, the movie the movie was kind of violent porn. I, I enjoyed it, but it was uh, that was a uh, it's a different topic, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, well, you, you, got, you guys have anything else to add about the the book? Um, oh. How about recommendations? If you're, would you recommend this to somebody on the train, or who would who would like this book, Ryan? I mean, that, that that's a question. Who would like this book? Who, who would you recommend it to? I think anyone who's interested in fantasy should should read Howard's stuff at some point. If you have any kind of interest in in these genres, I'd recommend you know. it to uh, kind of like a little boy bound to a wheelchair, <laughs> paraplegic, or something like that. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, this will make you feel a little bit better. <laughs> I put that boy in that wheelchair. Well, Rick, Rick you, you say the the violence is very descriptive, but I didn't feel like he went over the top. I mean, I remember this one scene where the the character sticks a a knife in in someone's eye, and that stuck out to me. But it stuck out to me because it, he wasn't doing that all the time. Well, see, I, I, I got a theory, though. These guys listen to a lot of radio. That was the uh, the high art. They write like to listen to radio. It is. I mean, these things could all be read aloud in the radio, and you get a good idea what was going on. And then I kind of have that in mind when I'm listening to it, especially on, I, the audio book is amazing. Just the uh, It really does play well to uh, that kind of theater. This book was a very well put together book. I mean, you have probably everything to, that there is about Solomon Cain. You have unfinished tales, the seven completed tales. You have some poetry, and then you have a short bio about uh, Howard, and you even have an opening piece by H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote something about Howard's death when it happened. And, and then there's appendix at the end that talks about the original uh, writings and and how they were changed in the ma- magazine stuff. I think this is, this book itself is a great buy. Yeah, I, I liked it. I think and the illustrations, yeah. like you said, I think people could get a lot out of this book, especially the younger males. Yeah. They might really appeal to them. All right, anything else? I agree. Okay. Uh, per- personally, didn't like it so much, but yeah, I can see how this would be popular amongst a uh, certain market. But you did feel like it was a you know, well written and, and, and fast. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, then that takes us to the movie Solomon Kane, directed by Michael Bassett. Wilk, why don't you give us a little uh, background about Michael Bassett, the director? He is extremely uninteresting. He there is not a lot going on there. I uh, he, he I think he's younger than I am. He's younger than all of us. He he grew up in in England. He's made some films, some of which were pretty decent. I, I I've seen I. I don't know if you guys are, are video game people. Well, actually, I know Ryan's not. I don't know if Rick is, but he directed a Silent Hill movie, which was pretty good, pretty faithful to the actual video game, which is a classic survivor horror game. And he has this dark bent in his movies, but there's a lot of TV series I haven't seen. And he, the, I found a quote by him that says, I'm pretty uninteresting and normal, which I, I have to back up. And he has a lot of work on crews and things like that. He, he looks like a guy who grew up and uh, kind of reminds me of some people that we know mutually, that he wanted to work in the entertainment industry or film, and he, but he got himself educated, got a degree, and he's working in film. And he's making some big films some small films, but he has steady work. And that's I, I really don't have much to say about him. He uh, People think he's better than, um, oh God, who's that horrible video game director? Uh, I can't. Yuli Bowl. They think he's a better director than him, based on message boards. But he hasn't done that much work, <laughs> you know. I saw that he started his career. He he, he wanted to be a, a vet in Africa, and uh, that didn't work out because of his uh, his grades in school. But he went on. <laughs> he went on to try to. I wanted um, to be an astronaut, but it didn't work out because uh, <laughs> I'm afraid of flying. So, <laughs> uh, but he, he went on to go to um, nature films. And I think he got involved in some kids' shows and stuff like that for a while. In his yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're really backing my point that he's not that interesting, but <laughs> we can keep talking about him. He wanted to be a vet, but he wasn't. He did some nature films. Uh, I know this girl that thought she was good at photography. Yeah, I mean, what the fuck? He, yeah, we, I think we got it covered. Okay. All right, Rick, why don't you give us a quick synopsis about the movie? Uh, the, the movie is a kind of like a single story uh, of uh, one of uh, Solomon Cain's adventures. Uh, this one takes place in England, kind of like feudal times. It starts with Solomon Cain swearing nonviolence, and he is traveling and trying to find his way after he gets kicked out of a monastery. He actually reverts back to his violent ways after a family who's been taking care of him has been uh, sabotaged or ambushed. Yeah. 
right after they die in front of him. You should have yeah. you should have reverted before. But well, yeah, sorry. well, he kind of had a premonition about uh, something nasty happen happening to him from a couple of you know uh, ruffians in the woods. Actually, something a lot worse than that happened right in front of his face to a little boy, and he that's when he that's when he flipped the switch and he just went sort of. Uh, balls out to uh, avenge the death and uh, uh, save the young woman from her uh, her captors. So it was kind of just kind of like a typical uh, formulaic film, uh, very predictable, but it was shot very well. I, I did enjoy the movie to a degree. I, I thought that the violence was, uh, I mean, it was there. It, it barely makes kind of like a rated R film, uh, more like PG-13, strong PG-13. Yeah, the the villains were were quite interesting. What else can I say about it? It, it stuck to a storyline that is pretty typical, and it, the only way that this hero story was a bit different than other other movies was that th- there was an element of puritanism and of having faith, and it sort of rang true to the uh, the original character. Obviously, I mean that's kind of what sets Solomon Cain apart from all other heroes, well, except for, you know, maybe some well, something written about crusading and that kind of thing. But um, yeah. the one thing that this movie did was it, it stayed all within the borders of jolly old England, and it really made England look like this, this you know, just real chaotic and feudal land, <laughs> which I'm sure it was at some point. Do you know where it was actually shot, though? It was, yeah. it was shot in the Czech Republic in that in that. I read of, that, yeah. The bad the bad part of Europe. Some of it, I, yeah. Some of it, I think, was shot in England, though. Some of it. It, it also has two of my favorite actors in there. I'm not my favorite, but they're just like they're great old character actors. One is Max von uh, Max von Sydow, who was in the Seventh Seal, and you, he was Solomon Kane's dad. Oh, uh, the Seventh Seal is basically it's a classic film. If you haven't seen it, you've seen parodies of it where he plays chess with death. Yeah. It's by uh, Inger Berman, and it's a uh, yeah, it's fantastic to watch. It's you know. Watch it late at night by yourself. It's great. I mean, then it's got the the guy from Jurassic Park and every other amazing movie. Uh, yes, Pete, Peter Postle yeah. and he may be dead. I yeah, I think he died of pancreatic can- cancer in 2011. I just saw that a little while ago. He, he did. He's yes. a great actor. I, yeah, and he was Steven Spielberg's favorite character actor, and he would appear. Yeah, he had. I mean, he was he had a big role in The Usual Suspects, big role in one of the Jurassic Park movies. But he's been in everything, and I I, I was yeah. kind of fun to watch these characters. I'm like, oh. I mean, they, and they really, the main guy, I didn't really recognize, but I, I guess he's in some popular show now, but like, the acting was very Is he good. he in Rome or something? I didn't, I've never seen Rome. I, I've read about it in school, but, uh. You know, James Purfoy, you're talking about, right? The main character, yeah. I think he, oh, he's James, in The Following yeah. with Kevin Bacon, I believe. So. Yeah, um, James Purfoy. Yeah, so, good acting. I, I think it, it's a, a kind of a tight, short fantasy film. It, it's just done really well. Uh, I think it's completely enjoyable. I, one thing that's different than the books is it the story. It's I, I don't think this story. The story keeps this movie keeps in the spirit of Solomon Kane, but it doesn't actually lift from one of the books or one of the short stories directly mm-hmm. that Howard wrote. Correct. And it weaves in this redemption tale where Solomon Kane in the movie feels like he, he's like he's a bad guy. He, he's actually I think a privateer, which is basically like a legalized pirate, and he just loves killing people, killing things. And then at some point death comes to give his soul to Satan and he rejects that and flees and then goes and joins a monastery, takes a vow of peace and mm-hmm. then he has to be violent again right. and it's he, he's concerned about, you know, redeeming his soul. Yeah. None of that is, is in the in the, is in Howard's stuff. They, I mean, they, it's basically like Hollywood giving Solomon Cain a motivation because in the books, like Wilk pointed out, he's just like a driven fanatic right. and you're not sure why he's doing this except for what he tells you which is he right. he just is he's just drawn to just root out all evil no degree of humility whatsoever in the book but uh quite a level of that in the movie mm-hmm. although honestly i could have done without the redemption story oh well, yeah but i mean it wouldn't have been a fleshed out movie w- without that uh, he wouldn't have been a completely fleshed out character without that uh-huh. which i thought that the stories kind of lacked you know that there there was a background question of really where was his faith and you know what was his motivation, but uh, it never really kind of went into that detail. Here, it puts it right under your thumb. Yeah, but I think that made it a little bit less original. Yeah. Well, shit. It's, it's, it's only a movie, you know. <laughs> yes, it is it's only a movie, but that's what we're reviewing: movies. Right. And the vow of peace that never happens in the books. Solomon is never ever talks about peace. He always feels that this is what he has to do. 
and it, this is just the way of the world, you know. And I, I think I saw some reviewer complaining about at the end when there's a big CGI demon he has to fight, but I, I thought the effects were great. I mean, yeah. there's that one scene where there's all these mirrors, and these demons come through these mirrors and grab these fighters and stuff. It was well done. Yeah, uh, I thought that was well done, but I, I do agree with the, the devil at the end. He, he looked kind of robotic. Uh, it was kind of grainy. Uh, it could have been done a little bit better, but uh, the movie was only, I, I think it was only made with $40 million, yeah. uh, and it grossed maybe twenty five. It, it, it didn't have a lot of push behind it. Like, they released it in... in I had no idea it was even a movie until I got Netflix. It yeah. popped up. They released it, like, in, in like... England, and then a year later in Europe, and then when it made it to the U.S., did it even get into the theaters? I don't see any gross. I, I checked. I didn't see any box office receipts for it in, in the U.S. I mean, there was a lawsuit about that. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's it, a good movie. It was a hold up due to a lawsuit uh, from the states, and I don't know what the uh, the source of that was or why anyone read up on that. I think I remember seeing something like that. I, I think you're right. I, I, like, I wonder if this movie just didn't get enough behind it, like marketing wise. Because I didn't know about it till I saw it on Netflix. Yeah, and it was very. I mean, it's got great actors. It, it was yeah. had a budget. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's a decent movie. I mean, it, it probably would, if it was, probably would have made money if it was promoted. It's kind of odd legal snafu that kept us from getting a lot of exposure in the states. Yeah, I I think that's what stunted really uh, its income was that it didn't get a whole lot of exposure yeah. there. But uh, it'd be kind of interesting to do a little bit of research and find out why that was. That's that's interesting to me. Because I thought it was well put together. Yeah, it's it's just like a solid yeah. uh, adventure film, like action. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the one thing I didn't really appreciate, and this is what every damn action movie does these days. Uh, if it's not about war between you know like two countries or something like that, when there's a lot of violence, it's usually between man and beast, and that's just to sort of take away the uh, the levity or the the profundity of violence. Which I think movies are very successful of doing. They, you know, they, they they celebrate violence, but it's with these fictitious things in the world that uh, you're kind of putting all that angst and aggression against something that doesn't even exist. Which I guess is a lot more healthy than you know, uh, you know, Reservoir Dogs or you know, actual uh, you know, Quentin Tarantino movie. I don't I don't like it when it's man against beast or man against a vampire or you know man against a robot those are the worst I, I i do like it it's more real uh it's more real and it's more humiliating and raw when it's real violence not not real but you know it's violence when there are humans on humans and uh a lot yada, of the, yada, yada let's make a stuff film what, go on i'm sorry what <laughs> nah, it's some joke but a stuff film Sorry. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I, you know, it's it just kind of uh, pointless violence. I, yeah, I, 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 it, it's not visceral. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, you, you don't feel it's when, when they're fighting the CGI demon. It's like, well, you know, you know what's going to happen here. Yeah, I, I, I like the human on human stuff too. Yeah, yeah, but there is human human stuff. I mean, there is. There, I, I, but I'm just saying the point. It, it sucks. In the finale of a movie is all cartoons. Mm-hmm. It happens with like every big movie now. It's like, well, uh, that was a good hour and a half. Now there's the half an hour animated finale where they fight lava. <laughs> <or something. laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you guys have got a point there. Maybe that reviewer had a point too. Yeah, why? I mean, I guess because he's a religious fanatic. You got to kind of tie yeah, that in. He's up against the devil. Yeah, right. You have to have the finale there. It's hard to to not go that way and just have him fight fight some evil king. But okay, but to get all cinematic, did you ever see the film Angel Heart that got the girl kicked off the uh, the Cosby Show? Mickey Rourke, Robert De Niro. Yeah, Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro plays the devil, and it's just Robert De Niro in an overcoat with really long fingernails yeah. and kind of a creepy look on his face. That to me is a scarier devil than. This bullshit. Yeah, I you know, agree. I mean, like, you, you a good actor can can yeah. carry that, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, not to get even too nerdy on you, but the movie Blade with Stephen Dorff is the bad guy, who's a complete douchebag. But they um they shot that an ending in that movie where it was all digital, and he turned to this giant vampire. That was kind of a, and then they decided, no, it doesn't work, and they they made the ending, which is pretty decent, with just them fighting mano and mano without the special effects and that was a pretty de- that's probably the last good movie that Les- Wesley Slate made and Blade Blade's pretty solid if you like yeah. the comic and the sci-fi stuff but yeah, yeah it's I hate I hate the over the top you, you can do more with less and I mean I, they, I hate it with like Star Wars and they got rid of the puppets and they put all the all the cartoon stuff <laughs> I mean well seriously the fucking Ewoks, Jim Henson yeah. Studios 
there's something to be said. Like Star Wars still holds up. The canteen scene that looks just, that looks great. I, I love that stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. This is good. It's like when whenever a new toy is invented, you have to like overplay with it. Yeah. You know, until until you calm down and realize, okay, here's what's appropriate. Yeah, but it, 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 it just doesn't impress me. It's like, well, you're, it's literally a cartoon. I mean, this is uh, it's been done. <laughs> well, uh, what about uh, Rick? Some final comments about the book and movie. Um, I, I I did think you know, even though the movie didn't really take directly from the uh, the stories, it did a good job depicting uh, the character without the racial racial uh, undertones, which is totally appropriate for a filtered out movie to be uh, broadcasted to the public. But, you know, it's uh, the movie was tight, and each one of uh, Robert Howard's stories are tight as well. I, I think Robert, though, he, he did linger a little bit too long with the action scenes. I, I just got kind of bored with it. I mean, yeah, it's I, for some reason, I just get bored with action. Okay, I think they, that's just a personal thing. I, I fell asleep during Godzilla. I was in the movie theater. It was just like blasting in my ears and I fell asleep. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's just me, guys. Wilk, what about you? I, I'm glad I read the book, but it really made me want to read H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> like, I read this, I'm like, God, this is good, but I want to read the best. I want, I want to read more Lovecraft stuff. It was good. I mean, to me, I think it'd be a great gift for a nephew or if you have a long plane ride or you don't want to think too hard when you read it. It, it goes... You get through it pretty quickly. Yeah, I think it's an excellent book, and I think characters like Solomon Kane and probably Conan and Cole and other characters by Howard are the reason why people like Clint Eastwood, Sylvester Stallone, and Arnold Schwarzenegger had careers. It's these deep oh, yeah, kind no, of like I... um, you know, uh, not real animated characters that just um, have you know a vendetta. I mean, it's just all kind of this archetype, like you said, Woke. And so I, I, I highly recommend this book. I think it's a great buy, and I thought the movie was really great too. It's just, I like both of them. I, I, I was pleasantly surprised, and I, and I, I'm. Oh, by the way, speaking of movies, while we're all live in the air here, what are we going? We're for next month. We're reading I Am Legend, right? Next month we'll be reading. Make sure everyone joins us next month when we read I Am Legend by Richard Matheson and the movie I Am Legend by Francis Lawrence. What should we tell our listeners to watch, though, in terms of the? Yeah, which movie? Well, that's the movie we're going to focus on. We may also mention The Omega Man that was directed by uh, Boris Segal and The Last Man on Earth that was directed by, or it will, by Vlado Rogano and uh, Rogona and Sidney Salkow. It starred Vincent Price. I'm going to insist we watch all three because <laughs> I, I, I love this book. I love this author, and I hate that fucking Will Smith movie. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm up for it, and I'm um, Oops, trying to get I'm surprise trying to get, real. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm trying to um, get my cousin to come on, who's an amateur filmmaker, to uh, add some film insights. But yeah, we can we can watch all of it's, it. It's it's one of the best horror fantasy books ever written in advance. Sorry, I Am Legend is that about vampires? Kind of. I mean, I'm not read up on that yet. Okay, it, it's like it's like vampires when it jaws is about a shark. Mm. To me, it's about people. And how they react to vampires. And, and Will Will Smith is actually in a vampire movie? It wasn't even really vampires in I Am Legend, though. It's like a chemical. It's a whole thing. You'll have to wait and see when you read it. All right. So I want to invite our listeners to... I can't wait. ...subscribe on iTunes, because we could always use subscribers, and to like us on Facebook, tweet about us. And check out drycracker.com, my website, which will be up and running. Yep. And the Vonnegut House will be um, available for rental pleasure. Pretty soon, a couple weeks. Yeah, and by the time this uh, is out, my new story, Mildred, about a young lady who moves into a house on a hoarder, will be out and available. And I'm, I'm excited, because this is your first story that I've read where you ventured into Sounds Like Horror. I've read some of your sci-fi, and, or all your sci-fi. I'm, I I love horror. It's my favorite genre, sort of. It's a, it's a little bit more psychological suspense than true horror, but I, I was, you know, I had that in, in mind. It's it, it does go towards that. More than... More, I go more towards that than I have in previous writings. I'd like to encourage anyone that hasn't downloaded it yet to get it. If you're listening to this, you are probably exposed to Ryan's stuff, but uh, it's probably pretty good. I haven't read it yet. But at this point, when you hear this, it'll already be out. So come on, get it. How long is it, Ryan? <laughs> it's about 40 pages. 40? It's a, it's a novelette. 40? 40. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. you can, get, can you get that in an ebook? It's it'll only be available in ebook format, uh, initially just on Amazon, and then eventually I'll open up to the other online distributors. Okay, so I can I can download it to my mobile device on, or Kindle or something like that? Yeah. All right. Well, good stuff. Sounds cool. Okay. Um, oh, one more question for Rick about the Monica yeah. House. I, I don't want to hold you down yeah. here, but actually my, my family is looking for a place to go on vacation. Okay. Is it on water? It, it's it's right on Lake Max and Cucky, which is about 12 miles in perimeter length, and uh, it's very 
sizable. It, it's a, it's the perfect place to take multiple families to. So actually, you know, it's you know you got to get a lot of people to come in, and it's it's all about having family fun. And we're working on getting a boat. Where there's great connectivity out here. So well, that, yep. yeah, well, yeah. So how many people does it sleep total? There is uh, four bedrooms, one of which has three bunk beds. Oh wow! Uh, for the children. There's a master bedroom downstairs on the first floor. There are three bedrooms upstairs for the adults. And there's some great views of the lake, uh, some great sunsets. And if you're just kind of like looking to have, you know, kind of like a good time, uh, anybody can kind of find a spot in the house or outside on the pier and maybe have a little bit of quiet time. There's tons of activities in the lake or in town. Or at the academy, cool. so come on out. When will it be ready to be rentable, or is it ready now? We're working on the floors right now, and we've got the house stocked pretty much with everything we really needed to. We're looking for some uh, wireless stereo equipment right now so that people can kind of play off of their uh, iPhone devices or tablets. They bring them. I'm sure they will. So, okay, so it, like it's going to be ready to be rentable, like, what month? This month, at the end of this month. Oh, yeah. really? And this by this month, you mean... July? Yeah, like beginning of July, it should be ready to go. We have we have actual renters coming in for the 4th of July. Cool. Week. Well, congratulations. That's pretty oh, awesome, yeah. and cool. uh, hopefully we get some pictures and yeah. things up. Okay. We're stoked. Speaking yeah. of angry people. Look it up. Yeah. Uh, well, do you want to say the website? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but look up uh, okay. Clemens uh, Vonnegut House or something along those lines. For more information on this episode's subject matter and to read our show notes, and post your witty comments. Visit us at nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. For more information on David Wilkinson or Richard Bell, view their profiles at goodreads.com. The theme music for this podcast was written and composed by John Doyle from the band I Decline. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We hope you've learned a lot. Oh, and always remember one thing. There is no deodorant in outer space. (laughs) <laughs> what was that? I, I just read about it, but I didn't dig into it because I thought you would have dug into it, Will, since you were kind of doing the director and all that. <laughs> oh, no, I, 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 I thought I was doing the author. I kind of panicked here when you started talking about him. So. Oh, shit. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, well. you switched the synopsis, it up. not oh, the bios. Well, I, I just saw Switch. I did a lot of oh. research on Howard. I mean, I, so, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of like I panicked when I watched the movie. I'm like, did I just misread this? I, I, like, did I skim this book too quickly? Because like, none of this happened in the book. No, yeah. So I, uh, I, I'm actually re- researching the movie right now as we're talking. Oh, okay. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. Uh, nah, but r- r- real quick, did I use the same word five times in a row somewhere? I'm, I, 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 missed I don't know. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> All right. I, it's been a long day. Sorry. We'll, we'll put editing things out. Okay. Let's get. Let's jump back into it. We were talking about. No, Something. all this being recorded. Anyway, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's everyone go. Let's do this all coordinated and thoughtfully. Oh, <laughs> were we recording this?